Hi, everybody. <laughs> this is amazing. So, I mean, I just met Kelly from Australia. Wow, huh? <laughs> so, for the last couple of days, I've been trying to imagine what this would be. Being able to stand up in front of you and, and share a few minutes of your time and share a little bit of my story and to, to speak to a group such as this, I had no idea it was going to be this big. This is amazing. So thank you for being here. And I hope something I share has some value to you. Uh, you know, they say that if you're nervous in public speaking, you should just imagine the audience naked. Good thing for both of us, I'm not nervous. <laughs> my name is Bree Barrowman, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am so pleased to have been asked to speak to you today and share a little bit of my story. Thank you, Gather, for the invitation, and thank you, each one of you, for being here. It means a lot. Please know that what I share is my own experience. It is not a guide or a pattern for you to follow. I find it unique and consider myself to be most fortunate. I am hopeful that what I share will be of some worth. And if you find it to be of value, I am most grateful. My experience with finding hope in Christ needs a little backstory and requires me to be a little bit vulnerable. Perhaps Brene Brown said it best when she said, vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. Vulnerability is not a weakness. It's our greatest measure of courage. So I'm going to be a little courageous and I'm going to be a little vulnerable. And here we go. I was born December 25th. 1957, the youngest of six children. Now it's not, to polite, it's not polite to ask a lady her age, but you can do the math. I have a graduate degree in geophysics, and I'm currently a middle school science teacher. So if I see you playing with your phone, I'm gonna come take it from you. <laughs> I was baptized a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at the age of eight, and I'm currently a somewhat active member. I experienced significant gender incongruence, which is a mismatch between my gender identity and the gender assigned at birth. I also experienced moderate gender dysphoria, which is the distress brought on by that incongruence. I am what is termed by society transgender female. Although I'm attracted to females, so maybe I'm lesbian. And my friends that have known me all my life, they always thought I was gay. I guess I'm just trying to collect all the letters. <laughs> I've been married for 43 years to Kit, my wife, spouse, and helpmeet. We have four biological children and one adopted child. I currently serve on a gender incongruence group with Lift and Love and have, have, have association with Affirmation, Emmaus, North Star, and as of April, all Arizona. Whoop. I had as far as I know what most would say was a normal childhood in an average middle class family. Usual childhood experiences like going to school, playing with friends, maybe most importantly, learning to ride a bike, which I still do a lot. I also remember having experiences that were reactions to feeling different, like things were just a little out of sync for social norms, like wanting to spend time with my sisters, play Barbies, or use their easy bake oven. But at the time, I didn't think too much about it and went about being a kid. Unlike most people, P 
Puberty and adolescence was difficult for me. <laughs> you did really well. I have ha-ha written there. <laughs> I realize now that my experience during this time were a result of what was gender incongruence. That feeling of a mismatch between what I felt was my real self and my developing body. I started to notice that I didn't recognize the face staring back at me in the mirror. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't me. I remember thinking about gender and wondering why I wasn't female. Just, things were just a mess. Imagine, if you will, a portrait painting by Picasso. At that time, I didn't understand it, nor I did I have the words to describe it. Unable to express how I felt, and fearing the judgment of others in the social construct of the day, shame, guilt, and fear started a feeling of self-loathing. I lived with this experience for roughly 50 years, including 40 years of marriage. But with my hobbies, work, raising a family, being busy, doing everything I could 24-7, I was able to deal with it for the most part. I now have friends who describe these feelings of incongruence and dysphoria in several different ways, such as feeling car sick and not able to put the window down or get out of the car, or feeling like a pressure cooker on the stove with the water boiling and the lid ready to blow off the top. For me, I would describe it more of a feeling of white noise like my body was just full of static. Not so much a feeling of being sick, but just wanting somebody to tune in the station. I call it constant tension, uneasiness, discomfort, distress. Advice from my religious leaders over the years, no fault of their own, fell within the standards of the teachings of the church be more faithful, pray harder, read the scriptures, and it will go away. When it didn't, I started to wonder what was wrong with me. I was later assured that if I kept the commandments, went to the temple, and served a full-time honorable mission, I would be cured. And when I wasn't, I knew there was something wrong with me, and I began to think I was broken. Again, I was told to marry a good woman and she would fix me. Despite doing all of this and marrying the most wonderful woman I've ever known, my incongruence persisted. I was broken. And I knew if anyone found out about me, they would leave me and I would lose everything. And still looking in the mirror, I didn't know the person looking back at me. I didn't really relate to myself in pictures. <laughs> that can't be me. I didn't like what I saw, and dysphoria and self-loathing made me wonder how anyone could ever love me. This led me away spiritually, and I began building walls. I built walls between me and others, including walls between me and Kit my family, my heavenly parents, and my Savior. I began to see God and Christ as vengeful and judgmental, focused only on punishing me, always afraid of being in trouble because I was wrong. For those of you familiar with the book Faith After Doubt by Brian McLaren, I now understand that for a long time I lost faith. I lost hope in Christ. I retracted into beliefs I had been taught. I painted the window to my world blue and kept ticking the boxes, going through the motions, believing in a contractual relationship that I had to earn my Savior's love. I had to keep the window painted blue. In a meeting with priesthood leadership in December of 2019, it was real, revealed to me that they knew my secret. 
and because of that I was not worthy to hold a temple recommend. Having continuously held a recommend since December of 1976, this was quite a traumatic event at the time. This also put me in a situation where I had to share my, with my family what I thought they could never know. Kit, instead of leaving me, like I'd always thought she would, immediately became my biggest and greatest ally, and we embarked on a new journey of discovery, love, and acceptance, which uncharacteristically strengthened our relationship. We were led to other people and organizations that offered unconditional love, and we learned to hug. If you haven't been hugged here yet, you haven't been here. And we learned to offer love to others that had similar experiences. Knowing I was loved unconditionally by Kit and others we met set in motion more than one form of transition for me, helping me to start loving myself, which helped me to start taking down the walls I had built and le led to a rebirth of my relationship with others, a rebirth of my relationship with my heavenly parents and our Savior Jesus Christ. It changed my life. I had believed what I was taught, that giving in to personal feelings that falls somewhere along the LGBTQ spectrum would move me away from the Spirit and from the Savior. It was just the opposite. It was the hiding, the sneaking, the shame, and the guilt that drove me away from the Spirit. A quote from a podcast with Bill Rill really hit home to me, which some of you may relate. He said, when you're not authentic, there's a burden. There's another burden when you are authentic and you risk things. I carried such a burden feeling broken. I also knew there was a burden being my authentic self. Being vulnerable would be and is a risk. Yet Christ asks us to be vulnerable with Him. Vulnerable with him. He asks us to give Him our burden. Matthew eleven thirty, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Sharing the burdens we carry is being vulnerable. It's a huge risk for me when I was finally able to be vulnerable with my heavenly parents and give Christ my burden I found unconditional love, which helped me reestablish my relationship with them and start building faith and hope in Christ. With each step of my journey, I felt guided to be my more authentic self and was rem reminded to remember 1 Samuel 16, 7, For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. For me and my experience, every word of this had such an impact, and it came, and I came to understand that there will be those who judge me, possibly persecute me for my outward appearance. But that isn't what the Lord looks at. The Lord looks at my heart. Where is my heart? From this, I felt guided to be an advocate and an ally to others that may have similar experiences to reach out in love and support to everyone, no matter their story or their journey, to give my authentic self and my heart to my heavenly parents and my Savior, to love and serve as Jesus did. At the time, almost four years ago, I didn't recognize this unexpected or unplanned detour in my life to be positive, especially not a blessing, and wondered how or if I might survive. However, looking back, 
I would not change it or trade it or undo it. This part of my journey has been most wonderful. Step by step, I have found the hidden parts of me buried deep within. And I not only feel as though a great weight has been lifted from off my shoulders, but I finally feel whole. I am real. I am not broken. I am not a mistake. This is me. And it's not bad. <laughs> I have an amazing wife who taught me what unconditional love feels like and what it means to be a helpmeet to each other. When I'm dressed and ready for the day, I now look in the mirror and like what I see. <laughs> I recognize the face looking back at me. I feel love. I feel peace. I feel a spirit more than ever before. I have faith. I have hope in Christ. With what I have come to understand that everyone, with that I have come to understand that everyone, no matter where they are in their journey, has value. Everyone has worth. Everyone is loved unconditionally by heavenly parents and the Messiah. And if they don't know that, if you don't know that, then it's up to me to help you feel that. My lifelong understanding of God and Christ as being vindictive judges couldn't have been more wrong. I had forgotten that the plan from the very beginning is to help us inherit exaltation, and eternal lives. I had become blinded and focused only on judgment and the law. I had forgotten about the grace offered to me freely by my Savior. Adam Miller in the book Original Grace reminds us that sin uses God's law to ask what is deserved. Grace uses God's law to ask what is required. I have come to know that it is more than healing the leper, giving sight to the blind, or raising Lazarus from the dead. It is more than Gethsemane and Calvary. It's recognizing each and every one of us on a personal level and knowing the help we need to continue on our own individual journey back to them. The atonement was institu institutionalized before this life and it never ends. It is an eternal companionship if we will let it be. That's the good news. That's the hope in Christ. His recorded life's mission was not to judge or condemn. It was to unconditionally love, and he asked us to follow him. One hymn that I like a lot modified just a little bit into one verse. <clears throat> Where can I turn for peace? Where is my solace? In my Gethsemane, he is my savior and friend. Gentle, the peace he finds for my beseeching. Constant he is and kind. Love without end. There is hope in Christ and more. There is and can be faith in the grace of his atonement. I know of my heavenly parents' unconditional love for me 
that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, that there is an eternal plan, that there is unconditional love from our heavenly parents and our Savior. I testify of unconditional love for them, for each of you, that through his grace we can all feel the love and receive the blessings we need to continue on our journey to return to them. There is hope in Christ. I share my love with each one of you, my amazing, wonderful LGBTQ family. Thank you.